We'll be reading verses 8 through 14. 1 Samuel 13, verse 8. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering just as he finished making the offering. Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering, and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. We've read from 1 Samuel 13 in preparation for this morning's exhortation entitled, Saul at Gilgal, to be presented by our brother Russ Johnson. Brother Russ. Well, good morning, everyone. If I can bring the uh, exuberance that our brother Oliver brought this morning. But you certainly, as they say, broke the ice. So there are plenty of ice around, (laughs) and I saw that for sure this morning. Uh, anyway, uh, I get started. Last weekend I was down in Hartford City, Indiana, and that's where um, COGAF has their shepherd's retreat. So it was an opportunity to see the brethren that don't get to see that often. And uh, it was set up so that we were talking about some of the attributes of God and how we needed to have those attributes, things like forgiveness, things like compassion, patience, long-suffering, justice, these type of attributes that God has and he wishes us to have also. <clears throat> During the discussion on patience, the passage that Chuck talked about this morning was brought up. Um, Saul wasn't a very patient guy, and he decided to do the offering on his own, and uh, he was told by Samuel that he didn't do right and that he basically was looking for someone whose heart was similar to that of God, someone who had these characteristics that we talked about last week, and we know that someone who was anointed by Samuel was David. Got me to thinking about a couple of things that happened in this particular episode, I certainly think patience was something that was difficult for Saul at the time, but I think there was a much bigger problem that I think as Chuck read it this morning, our brother read it, you could tell that um, there, was, there was a lot more amiss than just waiting and being patient. The fact that he went forward and did the sacrifices on his own and the fact that he decided that he wasn't going to follow a commandment that had been given to him by Samuel. I think being the biggest issue, didn't follow the commandment. <clears throat> and it got me to thinking last week of David, the one that was going to supplant Saul. Um, he got involved in a situation um, somewhat similar in ways, dissimilar in other ways, but uh, he did take action, and he took action as a priest, it appears. doesn't say that he didn't. And some have argued that that was one of the issues that Saul did something that um, a priest should be doing. So it made me kind of wonder a bit, because if you look at Second uh, Samuel 24, and I'll read this, you don't have to go to it, but in Chronicles, the same message is that David ended up doing some things that you kind of wonder about. So from 2 Samuel 24, beginning with verse 15, this is um, some background. This is when David chose to number Israel, and it was the wrong thing to do. 
And he got into a heap of trouble for doing this. And so this is the one, I think, from your Sunday school class where he had the three choices, and he chose to have God's will come down on him, the pestilence that was offered to him versus... Uh, um, other types of pestilence from his neighbors who could be at war with him. And this is the one that David chose. So it says in verse 15, So the Lord sent a pestilence, this is what David had asked for, upon Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men, no small sum by any means. And when the angel stretched forth his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented of the evil and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the uh, threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. And then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was smiting the people and said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly, but these sheep... What have they done? Let thy hand, I pray, they be against me and against my father's house. Just aside here, I don't think his sheep hadn't done anything. I think they had done something, but it just shows where David was coming from and how he looked at his people, some of these attributes we talked about at their gathering down in Hartford City. Going on with verse 18, And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, rear an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arun of the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Aruna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went forth and did obeisance to the king with his face to the ground. And Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of you, in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be averted from the people. And then Aruna said to the said to David, Let my Lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering, and the threshing sledges, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All of this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, The Lord your God accept you. But the king said to Aruna, No, but I will buy it for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord needed supplications for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. We know from Exodus that the ones that were doing the offering were those from Levite. Exodus 29, 44 said, I will consecrate the tent and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. And I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord, the God, who brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God. So it appears that um, perhaps they didn't do this offering. Maybe they did it, but it says David did it in both accounts. So it seems like those of Aaron were, and the Levites, were the ones that were supposed to be doing this offering. So, you know, what's the difference between the actions of Saul and the actions of David? It almost appears that we see David, or Saul was impatient, but we also see, too, that David acted very swiftly and decisively. He went swiftly and decisively, and some could say, Well, Saul was definitely impatient. He didn't wait long enough, but he, you know, saw things happening and he decided to go his own way, which was, as we know, disobedience on his part. Saul didn't follow the instructions that he was told to to do from Samuel. Saul didn't confess that he had done any sin either. He didn't apparently think he had committed any sin. David, in this particular episode that we read with the numbering, he did confess that he had sinned. And David did follow the the instructions of Gad. So it is uh, prophetic what was being said by Samuel, that this was someone after his own heart that was going to replace Saul. In Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, in the 12th verse, it says, 
So now, O Israel, what does the Lord require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees that I am commanding you today for your own well-being. So back in Deuteronomy, the children of Israel were being told this, or the, the Hebrews as they left the land were being told, this is what you're required to do. This is what God asks of you. And think of that in the context of what David did and also what Saul did. Completely different context. The 51st Psalm tells us, verses 15 to 17, um, 16 to 17, For thou hast no delight in sacrifice, were I to give a burnt offering, thou wouldst not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, and a broken and contrite heart, O God, wilt thou not despise. So you, God won't despise somebody that comes before him in that way. So again, think back to Saul, the tale of two people, not two cities, but two peoples. One, how does he come before God? What does God require of him? What did God require of David before he sacrificed? And maybe that's the reason he could sacrifice. Micah repeats the same thing in uh, chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord, Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what he's requiring of them. That's what he's requiring of us. So this contrite heart that we need to have, walking humbly, come before the sacrifice in David's case. And that's something um, that's difficult to do. I know I was reading one of the brothers was saying, I'm guilty of this by, by the way. You know, he said, well, you know, if you tell God you're coming before him humbly, you're probably not. You know, you need to learn that. You need to be taught that. And it's true. It's true. I've certainly been guilty of that. Um, we have to be taught how to come before him. We have to taught, be taught to have this contrite heart to come before him. We have to be taught how to love mercy. So there's quite a few valuable lessons that come out of this situation with Saul. First lesson, I think, is that God wants and desires our obedience. That's needed, number one. Secondly, patience is often needed to follow God's word. Thinking in Revelation, there are several times when he talks about the ecclesia and their patient endurance. You know, you have to be patient and enduring at the same time, which I don't think Saul was enduring. And the third thing is that there are some neg negative consequences when we choose our way over God's way. And, you know, we have to look at that as if God is trying to bring us back, not just so that he's seeing, seeing if he can punish us for uh, doing something wrong. We need to be brought back, but there are consequences to what we do. So we don't do and we shouldn't do what's always convenient in our own life. Obeying God's word is definitely the best choice in our lives and service unto others that he mentions. So how did David succeed and Saul was unable to succeed? Well, David kept in touch with his Savior. Saul did not. Isaiah 43 tells us, I, even I am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. So David recognized that. The only way he could be saved from his um, bad choices was to come to God in that and recognize that, confess his sin. And so... I'm going to switch in gears a little bit, but I think it fits in. So David did walk with God. And he fought off the slumbering, the sleep that can happen to all of us. And one of the ways that was mentioned is to have a contrite heart and to know that that's what God requires of, of us. In order to do that, we got to be awake. We have to be seeing what's going on. Isaiah warns us in the 56th chapter, 10th verse, his watchmen are blind, and talking about Israel, all of them know nothing. All of them are mute dogs unable to bark. You know, I've got a watchdog in my front yard, can't bark. That's no good. 
What is that? How does that help you? That's what God's saying is happening in Israel. He says also that besides being able to, being blind and can't bark, they are dreamers lying down who love to slumber, like to sleep. You know, I, I like to get good sleep, but then uh, I like to get up. But we know that uh, slumbering can be a problem. And David is said to have written the 121st Psalm, and uh, verses 3 and 4 say, talking about God, he says, He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And we know that's an attribute of God, right? He's always there, though we're sleeping at times. We're not always there. You know, uh, the psalmist also says about God, Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Because rouse yourself, do not reject us forever. Uh, we know God doesn't sleep, just read that. But they're saying that, I think, to say to themselves, and I think this is the contact that David's writing about. I need to be in constant contact with you because I, I think you're not with me. And I think we've all experienced that, haven't we? Sometimes it's like, I don't think God knows what's going on in my life. Well, we know he does know what's going on in your life. It's just sometimes we forget it. And so I think what's said in the psalm is, you know, rouse yourself, do something to me so that I can remember that you're there. And, you know, being here is rousing yourself to remember, to keep in remembrance who Jesus is and why he had to die. Moving on to the 35th Psalm, the 22nd verse, it says, Thou hast seen, O Lord, be not silent, O Lord. Do not be far from me. That's what I'm saying. Don't be far from me. Bestir thyself and awake for my right, for my cause. My God and my Lord vindicates me. O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say to themselves, Aha, we have our heart's desire. Let them not say we have swallowed him up. And I don't think it's so much for David's vindication or the writer of the psalm. It's that God might be vindicated. I think that's the thing that we have to keep in our mind. It's not that we're always going to be vindicated. You know, it's great if we are. But we certainly pray that God's plan is vindicated. We know he will vindicate himself eventually. So it's important to know that. And, I, you know, it, the sleeping part... I. I, I don't know about you, but um, sometimes when you read a book, or you're kind of just kind of dozing off, I have to say, sometimes when I'm watching the news at night on TV, it's like, oh, I just missed 15 minutes of the news. You know, just kind of dozed off. And I hear God's telling us to be awake. Of course, he's not talking about watching television or reading a book or whatever you might be doing when you doze off. But... We're supposed to be awake, and I think that's just a good analogy to let us know we're supposed to be awake. But we also know that that's not the way it always works, does it? You know, Jesus tells that and must uh, tells us that in Mark 13 concerning his return. He says in verse 32, "But of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father." Take heed, watch, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. And when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch, watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, midnight, or at cockcrow, or in the morning. And verse 36 says, lest he come suddenly and find you awake or asleep. He's saying, and what I say to you all is watch. So he said, I don't want to find you asleep. Romans chapter 13 says, or actually I'm going to go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, where Paul in his letter to Thessalonica says, so then we should not sleep as the others, but we should watch and we should be sober. We need to watch and be sober. Then Romans chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. Do this, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
So he's saying, don't live in darkness. Darkness is not where you want to be. You want to live in the light. You want to be awake. You want to be sober. Uh, well, we know this happened to the disciples, didn't it? You know, Brother Don Davies was here a couple of years ago, and he gave an exhortation on the fact that the disciples couldn't even wait, pray with him an hour, right? Couldn't do that for an hour. In Matthew 26, 40, it says, Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch for me for one hour? He asked Peter. Let me ask you this. I'm going to switch gears. Has anybody ever run out of gas in their car? Uh, yeah. It's like <laughs> either we were watching or just hoping that there was going to be enough fumes to get us to the gas station or we weren't paying attention. And so... That's kind of why uh, we've got the gauges in the car now, right? You, you, you look at that, assuming it's working. Of course, I've had some that haven't worked, too. But you look at that gauge because it's a warning to you. And Jesus provides us something similar to that, uh, but much more important, obviously. When he talks about the parable of the virgins, the ten virgins in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, all of them went to sleep, but five didn't go, or five, all of them slept, but five were wise. How were they wise? Does anybody know from the Sunday school class? Why were five of them wise? They had oil, right? They decided, maybe I should have some oil just in case something, and I'm not all there. And so they did fill their flask with oil. And you know, we have to have God's word in our life. We have to have constant prayer. Now, Jesus in this parable said, hey, you know, if you think it's not going to happen to you that you're going to fall asleep, well, think again, because it could very well happen. But be in the word, I think he's saying. Be constant in prayer. Because you, if you have oil in those flasks, you'll get through it, even if it happens to you. But if you don't, if you decide that you're not going to do that, then you're going to have a problem. And I don't know if you noticed um, in this, I really didn't pay a lot of attention, but in that parable, the ones with the oil tell the other ones to go out to the marketplace, whether, and they tell them to buy it, right? You need to go out and purchase it. You need to buy it. That's what you need to do. So we have to take ownership in our lives, in our spiritual lives. We need to do that. If you think back to what David went through earlier when he was having this discussion with Aruna about what was required, and remember Aruna said, I'll give it to you. I'll give you all this stuff you want. I'll give you the, the, the uh, animals of sacrifice. I'll, I'll give you the land. And what does David say about this? in his leadership of the kingly role and the priest that he is obviously performing for his people, does he say, thanks for giving it to me? No. He says to him, I need to buy it. I need to take ownership of it. I need to be the responsible one here. David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was smiting the people and said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thy hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's home. Jesus took responsibility. And you can think of others. I was just thinking of the daily readings. Nehemiah took responsibility. Like, he's responsible for his forefathers who messed up, right? He's saying, I'll take the responsibility. It's incumbent on me to do that. So we're remembering this greater David today. We're remembering Jesus. Remember when Jesus says to the Pharisees in Matthew 22, what do you think of the Christ? Who can he, who, whose son is he? They said to him, oh, he's the son of David. And he said to them, how is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put thy enemies under thy feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how is, his, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. So he's saying, you know, how, how am I related today? Well, your son, no. 
It's more than that, isn't it? He is the greater David. He was without sin, unlike his forefathers. Jesus was without sin. Peter tells us that in 1 Peter, the second chapter, the 22nd verse, saying about Jesus, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Among many passages are uh, throughout the New Testament, we, we see that. We know that he was without sin. Nothing came out of his mouth that was wrong. But wait a minute. He's saying in Corinthians, Paul's saying, you were bought with a price. You were bought. It's like David had to buy the property, just as Jesus said about the parables of virgins. They've got to go out and buy it. So Jesus talks about us saying, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So just as David built this altar and paid for everything, and, he, and this is what he said again. Remember David said to Arana, no, but I will buy it for you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Just reiterating that. He had to buy that. So a cost was paid. A cost was paid as mentioned in the parable. David had to pay a cost. He took that responsibility. And Jesus is saying, you're bought. We're bought with a price. And with that comes a real cost, doesn't it? Jesus had to die. But like David, after his own heart, David willingly did that. And I think you can probably think of other examples I can, but we're not going to go into that. He did that because... He wanted to do that for his people. It wasn't like, well, maybe I should do something. It was like, I need to do something. I want to do something for my people. And if you can magnify that by, I don't know how many times, thousands of times, Jesus wants to do that for him, for people that don't want to be slaves of men. That's who he wants to do it for. 1 Peter 5 goes on to say about that price, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. So we might be exalted by humbling ourselves. And we go again back to that lesson of Saul. It's clear God desires obedience in Saul's case. And he wants patience, too, often as needed. The patient endurance, it's mentioned in Revelation and we realize there are negative consequences in our life when we decide to do things on our own. But at the same time, we remember, I, in my mind, why could David do that? Just go back to Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Not a ton of, of animal sacrifices, but to keep your heart contrite, to walk with him. And let's remember that price that he paid, and that we can walk with God because of that. 